So today I'm going to be telling you about the long bones, all the basic facts, the relevant important facts about the long bones, which are important for your viva bursting and all, and your MCQ purpose. And the focus here will be on the cooing in of the long bones. So let's begin with the long bones. So what is a long bone? Long bone, here you see, what I'm drawing here is a long bone, right? So a long bone has this portion, middle portion, and at the two ends, these are the epiphysis. So the portion here between is the diaphysis. This is called the diaphysis. Okay. Then at the two ends, you have this portion of a bone which ossifies separately and that's called epiphysis. This is epiphysis you see is on both the sides. Got it? Now in between the epiphysis and the ends of the diaphysis, like here, this portion here, at the ends of the diaphysis you have metaphysis. These are the most vascularized portion of the diaphysis. These are the metaphysis. Okay, so now interface between the metaphysis and epiphysis is a plate of hyaline cartilage interpressed here. So here you find is a plate of cartilage and this cartilage is basically called physis. This is called physis. It is made up of hyaline cartilage. This is made up of hyaline cartilage. Similarly, you have the opposite side also, the opposite end. You both have this the physis here also. Made of hyaline cartilage. You know now what I have mentioned is about the growing bone. This is the growing bone. Growing long bone. This is growing long bone. So this terminology, what I mentioned, you find is in a growing long bone. Now these cartilages interpressed here in between metaphysis and epiphysis, they are actually providing for the longitudinal growth of the bone. So, by the way, in an adult bone, like after all what is happens, this growth actually is in condal or ossification, and when this ossifies completely around 18 years of life, so what happens is that the, the two ends, the two ends that the epiphysis fuses with the metaphysis. And by the cartilage, the physis is actually used up. Then, in an adult bone, in an adult bone, adult long bone, you will find that you don't have this terminology. In an adult bone, what you call it as there are only three parts in a long bone. Okay. This is called the upper end, and this is called the lower end, or the base of a bone, and this is called the shaft. So this terminology, like in any long bone, you must have seen like a lot of long bones where you have OC clamp, there is upper end, there is numerous radius, detail, blah, blah. there were upper end a lower end and a shaft, the three terminal and even in case of miniature long bones like your metacarpals, metatarsals and even the phalanges, they are also considered to be miniature long bones, so they also have these three parts, upper end, lower end and the shaft. But in a low end growing bone, that is up till the skeletal maturity, these are the different terms of the, these are different parts of the growing bone. So, the, like what I was telling is about this, Physis placed between. So this actually is for the growth of the long bone. Now let me tell you about the ossification thing. So ossification, ossification is basically happening in the body in two ways. One is called intramembranous. 
intermembranous ossification other is encounter so there are two ways of ossification of bones intermembranous ossification is required when there is only the requirement of protection of the underlying structure so this is like a rapid process of ossification this is a rapid process of ossification like in case of the flat bones in the cranial part in an intrauterine life the brain is actually in a semi solid form it's a very delicate tissue so the brain actually needs early protection from outside and that's why the bones of the cranial vault and few other bones like clavicle also they develop by intermembranous ossification and this intermembranous ossification is a single step this requires only a single step ossification where like you have this two membranes and in between the membranes it's the osseous tissue that is laid down by the osteoblasts you know there are three types of cells cells of bone b cells of bone one is osteoblasts then you have osteocytes and the osteoclasts So osteoblasts are the bone forming cells the, that lay down the osseous tissue, that is calcium hydroxyapatite. Osteocytes are the mature bones, bone cells, and osteoclasts are the bone scavenger cells, also called giant cells. And these osteoclasts are actually the remodeling cells. So the the shape the bone you find in tubercles, trochlea, tuberculum, and um, different prominences of the bone, the all are being carved out by the osteocytes. And another one feature about the osteos class is that this is a cell which is multinucleated. So remember that osteoclasts are multinucleated. Okay, like a skeletal muscle cell that also is multinucleated, and that is called syncytium, right? Remember, placenta also you have a syncytium, like the outer layer of the trophoblasts, that also syncytium. So wherever you find multinucleated cells in a pool of cytosol, like some syncytium, so osteoclasts are the cells where you have multiple nuclei. Then the other process of ossification is endochondral ossification, and now this is a slow process. Slow process of ossification, and slow process means it takes around sixteen to eighteen years, or even more, like around twenty years, or sometimes even twenty-five years. But the average, the long ones, require this much of time to complete the ossification. And it takes two steps. There are two steps involved. One is first step, laying down of the cartilaginous framework, and later the cartilaginous framework gets ossified into bone. So there are two steps involved. So here now we are talking about us talking about the long bone. So the long bone here we have five steps. The highest cartilage between the top five steps. And that is providing for the elongation. That is providing the growth in the longitudinal axis of the long bone. Now we will talk about the growing ends of the long bone. What was that's a heading? So growing end of a long bone. So criteria number one is how many you identify. Like first of all, tell me uh, how many long bones you have in human body. You have three long bones: humerus, radius, and ulna in the upper limb. Three long bones in the lower limb. You have femur, tibia, and fibula. Plus, yes, the horizontally lying bone, clavicle, also. That's a part of the upper limb. So you have seven. Seven and seven is. Fourteen. Remember, there are fourteen long bones in the human body. 
we're not including the miniature long bones in this. So, but remember now, each of these long bones, as I was telling, the growth is happening here also and here. So, it's providing for the growth here and here, and at both ends like this. Right? So, bone is growing. But then, one of the two ends will be needing it. So, what will be that end? And that will be called the growing end. So, how do you know that which end of a long bone is a growing end? So, you should remember, like, we have of this diagram in mind here, like, considered to be a fetus. If this is supposed to be the position of the fetus, this is how a fetus is. Right? This is how let's presume that this is how a fetus is you know, lying down in uh, intrauterine conditions. Here what he is observing that all the major joints, they are in a state of flexion. You see that the elbow, the shoulder, the hip, the knee and even the spine is in a state of flexion. To assume you know, the minimal area to acquire minimal space in the uterus. So it assumes this position and this is called fetal line position. So this is fetal line position. Okay. So let's see the orientation of the long bones. Presume now what I am telling you. So like presumptive things. So just to remember that when the long bones, to presume like numerous in a fetus will be placed here, and here it will be radius along the preaxial border, and. Alna along the post axial border in the anti brachial or the forearm. Here it may be femur, the axial bone of the thigh. Then you have is tibia, the pre axial bone, and the bone along the post axial border they like this fibula. This is how the bone angle. Seventh bone is clavicle. Let's presume that this is clavicle. Right? So the seven long bones I have configured like how they are present in a fetus. The simple formula is that remember the growing end of the long bone, you should know that in the fetal line position, in the fetal line position, the end of the long bone near to the head is the growing end. Simple. So in this middle line position, you've seen the orientation of the seven long bones. The end of the long bones in the fetal line position that is nearer to the head of the fetus will be the growing end of that long bone. Got it? So in case of fever, which will be the growing end. Proximal or distal? Distal, right? Distal is towards the head. In this position, which will be the growing head or growing end of radius? Proximal or distal? Distal, distal is closer to the head. So, distal end of radius will be the growing end. Which is the growing end of femur? Proximal or distal? Distal, because distal end of femur is closer to the head. Which end of tibia is the growing end? Proximal or distal? Proximal. Which end of clavicle will be the growing end? Medial end or the lateral end? Medial end. Medial is closer to the head of the fetus. So that's how you can easily find out the growing end of the long bones. Got it? Then you know that each of these long bones they have a foramen. Somewhere in the middle of the shaft of humans, shaft of any long bone. Now, this foramen is not a transverse foramen, it is an oblique foramen, it is directed obliquely either to the upper end or towards the lower end. 
So, this is a nutritional foramen of any normal organ. Of course, the nutritional artery will be reaching inside. The vessels will reach through this. So, let's presume that this artery to the long bone enters to this nutritional foramen. And as it is, you know, it's a directed or directed foramen. It is directed upwards. So, this artery will reach to this end of the long bone. And there it then ramifies into these hairpin like capillary leaves. Now, this also is significant, like you know, that the metaphysis, as I told you, it's a highly vascularized portion of the long bone. So, in case of osteomyelitis, that's the infection of the bone, so the chances of infection is more here at the metaphysis. Got it? The reason is because they have these hairpin-like capillaries that causes colonization of the bacteria here at these ends. The metaphysis being the most uh, portion of the bone which has the most chances of undergoing osteomyelitis. Then here in this bone, this also, you know, it also gives out branches to the opposite end. And at the opposite end, you know, you also find is the hair being like packing of the capillaries at the metaphysis. But the nutrition artery is directed at what? So to know this, another fact regarding the growing into the long bones, you should remember this now. This diagram also is very important. what you are seeing here, right? So it's a tree. Now, imagine you are watering a plant. So when you are watering a plant, like you are providing nutrition, you are providing nutrition to the plant in this direction downwards direction. Got it? And the plant grows in the direction opposite to the nutrition being provided. So the plant is growing opposite to the nutrition being provided. That makes the second point to remember that second point states that the growing in of a long bone is opposite to the direction of nutritional foramen or nutritional artery. Easy. That's the second criteria where you can find out like what's the growing end of a long bone. If you just pick up a bone, you will easily find uh, because these are long bones, the nutritional foramen is easily visible. So just seeing the direction of the nutritional foramen, you can see say that opposite will be the growing end of the bone. Now, should I ask you like, what will be the growing end in this diagram? Will this be the growing end or this be the growing end? Think about it in the meantime. Now I'm talking about is this. Criteria number three for the growing of the long bones. This will be easier for the first year of graduates. Uh, you've seen like the seven long bones as I told you. Uh, let's say you pick up any long bone, you will find that the dead two ends, so one of the end is bulkier, it's bigger in size than the opposite end. So simple, like this for the first year and an easy go one. Uh, criteria. So remember this that the bulkier end, bulkier end of a long bone is the growing end. Bulkier end of a long bone is the growing end. Easy. 
pick up tibia. What is the pulp here? Upper end or lower end? Upper end. Right? Look at the iron and that's the cranium. You pick up femur, which is the bulkier and the condyle and the lower end, that's a grain. You pick up humerus, which is the bulkier and the upper end, the globular head, the head end, that's a grain. You pick up radius, the radius also is the femur upper end of the globular. Now, remember there is an exception here and that is alpha. So, you can mark out this, there you have an exception. Exception is alpha. Alpha is an exception to this criteria. The grain of alpha, remember the number one criteria. What will be the grain of alpha? Proximal or the distal? Distal end will be the growing toward the head. But alpha, you've seen that this is a tapering end, thin out. But this was the proximal end, it had a chromoid process, olecranal process, trochlear notch, and it's a bulkier thing. So this is not following, this is not following the criteria of the number one criteria. Now I should tell you that why is Anna not following this criteria? That being bulkier at it going in. The reason is and for this you need to know the types of kidney bodies. Types of epiphysis. This is what I was talking about. Types of epiphysis. Now, because let me tell you the other terminology used here, diaphysis actually, this portion is made up of cortical bone. This is called cortical bone. Or compact bone. Or Hawaiian bone, Hawaiian bone, because there's a Hawaiian pattern of here longitudinally. These arteries that runs inside here, they are like running vertically running canals. But these canals are called Hawaiian canals. And surrounding them to them is the concentric arrangement, the lamellar region of the osteocytes. So that's why it's also called as lamellar bone. Lamellar bone. It is also called lamellar bone. I'm not going into the histological sections. You, I presume you must be knowing that, or maybe I'll take a separate lecture on that. So that's called uh, lamellar bone. And all these Hawaiian canals, they are being connected by obliquely running canals called the Hoffman's canal. So these are the different features, special features about this cortical bone. It's a dense bone. Dense bone. Okay. What are the other names used for the ends of the bone? There is this type of bone is different. And this is a spongy bone. Spongy bone. People who are, are non-vegetarian, those who eat like you know, if you eat uh, non which you find bones. So when you chew the ends of the bones, you will find you can easily chew the ends of the bones in your meals. But you're not easily able to chew the diaphysis, the shaft of the bone. Because that's a dense bone. While the ends of the bone are spongy and that's why the spongy bone, they also have different things. There's also called cancerous bone. This is also called cancerous bone. And the pattern, the Hawaiian pattern, the concentric and centripetal and centrifugal arrangements of those osteocytes, the lamellar arrangement, you will not find here. And remember, around uh, vertically running Hawaiian canal, those concentric arrangements of those um, Hawaiian lamellae, together it's called an osteone. That osteone pattern is not present here. Here you have irregular trabeculated meshwork of lamel ion the, the bony tissue. So that's why this one is also called as trabecular. This is also called trabecular present at the end of the Now, these, the ends, they 
have some separate center of ossification. They ossify separately for the secondary cartilage center and when they grow, they attain their growth, then they fuse with the metaphysis and after the fusion there is cessation of growth. And that is called synostosis. So what I was telling is, you should know that there are these different epiphyses, there are also different types. The ends of the bones are also different types of Maybe not the even ends. Every physe is not necessary to be present at the ends. They might be present elsewhere also in the bone. So that's why you should remember now, I should tell you that there are different types of epiphyses. Number one is called the pressure epiphysis. Pressure epiphysis. Now what are pressure epiphysis? These are the pressure epiphyses. The ends of the bone, remember the ends of the bone, the epiphysis present at the ends of the bone, which bear the weight, which bear the weight or the stress and which participate in a joint. So they will be covered by articular cartilage. This also is a very important feature. So pressure epiphysis is one thing, they are the weight bearing, weight bearing epiphysis is one thing, they will participate to, in joint, participate in joints and they will be covered by articular cartilage, right? These are important points about the pressure epiphysis. Examples you can include head of humerus, lower end of the of humerus, condyles of femur, head of the head of femur, upper end, you know, tibial condyles. They are all examples of pressure devices. Now talking about the next type is traction. Traction epiphysis. Traction epiphysis, as the name suggests, where that at that point of a bone where there is a pull of a muscle or a ligament attached. So at that point, the bone has to be really strong. So this is traction epiphysis. You will find that the ligaments and bones where they are attached, you find an additional growth of bone, like the lesser tubercle of humerus. Tubercle humerus, subscapular is attached here, then you have supraspinatus and spinatus that is mine. So you have an additional bone, you have a medial epicondyle with a common flexor origin, lateral epicondyle, posteriorly has you know, uh, anteriorly has this open extensor origin. Though so, you have trochanters of the femur. So what do you see? There are a loop group of muscles attached, or sometimes there might be a ligaments attached, like the condyles of the femur down below. The ligaments meet in little collateral ligaments along it. So, when there is a stress on a bone, there is, there is the osseous process which lay down an extra bone, and that's the example of traction epiphysis. And note it down that the difference in your weight bearing in your eyes one thing is that it's not a weight bearing epiphysis, another thing it will be not be covered by articular cartilage. So, it is at the point, points of muscles, ligaments attached, there you find this, and no articular cartilage. Got it? Another example is, third example is atavistic, atavistic epiphysis. Now, atavistic epiphysis. Atavistic is centuries and centuries back. There were some bones which were independent bones. Now, the bone is seen to be fused to any other bone. Such a bone is called an atavistic epiphysis. These are made good examples to remember. In this, one example is coracoid 
process of scapula is one example of adult speaking devices. Other example is talus. You see, talus is clearly there are two tuberculosis. So the later later tubercle on posterior later tubercle on posterior aspect of talus and that is called os trigonal late on the posterior aspect of talus the later tubercle is called os trigonal and that is an example of atavistic devices then Sometimes at places where you normally don't find a bone, but sometimes you might find a bone placed there. Such an example, bone, you, you might find a device placed there, and that's an example of aberrant. Now this is aberrant, aberrant or supernumen, or supranumen epiphysis. Aberrant or supranumeric epiphysis means more than the required amount of epiphysis centers, the secondary ossification centers, there may be multiple ossification centers, more than the required and it's supra, supranumeric, super, super, uh, supranumeric or aberrant. Now, examples for this, you know, the metacarpals and pelinges. I think if it is visible here. Right? Is this visible here? Let's see. Presume that this is the first metacarpal, then you have a second metacarpal, you have a third metacarpal, you have a fourth metacarpal, and you have the fifth metacarpal. Right? And you will have phalanges. You will have phalanges here. As I've already told you that these bones, metacarpals, metatarsals, phalanges, they are also called miniature long bones. And I also told you they will be divided into three types: upper end, lower end, and a shaft. Similarly, you will have here also. Right? Now, the difference in the long bone and the miniature long bones that in a long bone you have one primary center of ossification. In a long bone, you have is one primary center of ossification placed somewhere in the center of the diaphysis. This is primary center of ossification. This is the primary center of ossification, placed somewhere in the center of the diaphysis for long bone. And you also have a secondary ossification center. Now, this is a secondary ossification center. So, you will also find secondary ossification centers in the epiphysis. The epiphysis actually start developing from a second ossification center, and these are present at both the ends of the long bone. Unlike the miniature long bones, so now what happens in the miniature long bone? There is one primary center of ossification somewhere in the <coughs> center of the diaphysis. Here you have the primary center of ossification for all these miniature long bones. These are all the primary center of ossification. Primary center of ossification. Right? Now, normally, now the miniature ornaments have only one epiphysis center, and that's the secondary ossification center is seen at only one end. And in case of this, metacarpals, metatarsals. The secondary ossification center is seen towards the head of the metacarpus. While in case of phalanges, 
the secondary ossification centers are present at the base secondary ossification centers in the phalanges are placed towards the base so these are secondary ossification center <coughs> okay one important thing to add up here is remember that the first why do you always count that meta phalange and uh, the phalanges are 14 in number why not 15 why not three phalanges in each of the digits thumb has only two phalanges now look here one point is that this first meta carpal has its secondary ossification center that's its epiphysis lies towards the base just like the phalanges so remember developmentally this is an important point remember developmentally first meta carpal behaves as the proximal phalange of the thumb just like the phalanges you have three phalanges in either digits but thumb has only two phalanges so why because the proximal phalange of the thumb is nothing but its ossification you know developmentally this first metacarpal behaves like a proximal phalange of the thumb so that was the normal pattern of ossification of these miniature long bones these are miniature long bones i was talking about aberrant necrosis now sometimes you might also find there are secondary ossification centers placed at the base of the metacarpals that means they have an additional ossification center at the base which is not present normally so such a ossification center is an example of aberrant epiphysis got it now? what i was telling is now this aberrant epiphysis remember aberrant epiphysis we talk about don't confuse with the normal os os epiphysis of metacarp metacarp carpal metacarps because the normal meta meta epiphysis is towards the head of the metacarpals for the four except the thumb one for the four digits same in case of foot also first metatarsal also behaves the same way as the proximal phalanx of the greater that means in the first metatarsal the normal epiphysis is towards the base while third second third fourth metatarsals the epiphysal center the second ossification center is towards the head but if they develop additional ossification centers now such like the base of the metacarpal is an example of aberrant epiphysis so you can add up here is like a base of metacarpals or metatarsals <coughs> if you find an epiphysis then sometimes you must have heard of about a patella patella is a bone like this a somewhat triangular bone both sides right that's a normal and it also points to several ossification center then polish to form a single bone but sometimes a piece of bone of patella fails to fuse with the rest of the bone like this some people eat. you might find patella is like this having two pieces and that's called bipartite bipartite patella you might even see a tripartite patella sometimes and you find a separate piece of bone at both sides and normally as a chronic remember that is supra later supra later in bipartite patella you find a separate piece of bone placed supra later right so in an x-ray 
like in a casual x-ray you might find this thing as a separate piece of bone and that will be a confusion when we fracture of patella so remember to go for a bilateral x-ray this condition will be present bilaterally right to rule out from fracture of patella Another thing is there should be a history of fracture, right? So history of trauma in case if it's a fracture. This will be present in this part, right? So you can add another example in aberrant intrapatellary is bipartite patella. Okay. So. Knowing this much about the different types of epiphysis, now we are back to this point that why ulna being the growing end is not bulky like the rest of the bones. You must have seen ulna. Ulna at its upper end has, you know, anteriorly has its coronoid process. Then is a trochlear notch. Then you have is the ox, you know, olecranon process behind. And a lot of many muscles attached here. On the coronoid, you have in the brachialis attached. On the olecranon process, you have triceps attached. Med laterally, there is supinator crest or that supinator is right attached. Medially, at this upper end, you have this, you know, pronated terrace taking origin. You have flexor pilaris, narrows, flexor pilaris, superficialis. Not many muscles taking origin from the upper end of ulna, even the medial collateral ligament over here. So you are in order. So the upper end of ulna being bulky is the reason is of being an example of traction epiphysis. And that's why this ulna the upper end is an exception to this. And also don't forget that the upper end of ulna is the weight bearing and in the radius it's the upper end of the radius that is the weight bearing. Ulna is the upper end because when you are lifting a heavy weight the weight from the carpus is shared to the lower end of the radius but weight is not transmitted from radius to humerus because this joint radio radial humeral joint is a unstable joint in an extended angle so weight from radius is shared through the interosseous membrane that's why the direction of collagen fibers remember directed downwards and medially towards the ulna so weight from the radius is shared to the ulna through the interosseous membrane and then through the ulna it will be shared to the humerus and humeral ulnar joint in an extended elbow is really a very strong joint. It's like this. Right? The trochlear, the olecranon process goes and fits inside in the olecranon fossa. Above to the trochlear, like this. So, in an extended position, the humeral ulnar joint is very strong joint. And so, the upper end of ulna is the weight bearing end, lower end of radius is the weight bearing end. So, what is the reason? Then about the fourth criteria of growing in the long bones. That's a law of ossification. So this law of ossification states, I have told you about the primary ossification center and the center of the diaphysis, then secondary ossification and the epiphysis and foliage. So remember that law of ossification states that the growing end of a long bone, growing end of a long bone is first to appear first to appear means the secondary the secondary ossification center at a growing end is first to appear and is last to fuse and is last to this is an important law of ossification that at the growing end of the long bone the secondary ossification center is first to appear then at the opposite end and now at the time of fusion the opposite end will fuse first and the growing end will fuse last so let's come back to this diagram 
Here you have told you that which is the growing end. You have seen this direction of nutritional artery from there, it's easy, right? So, obviously, this is the growing end because your nutritional artery is directed opposite. Growth happens opposite to the direction of nutrition being provided. So, the artery is being above, so this will be the growing end. Now, let's take an example. The secondary ossification center here. Let's say it's, you know, the law states that it will be first to appear. Let's say it appears at one year of life. This ossification, and by the way, about the secondary ossification center, the most important point is, the primary ossification center, I have it in here, remember, it's around 6 to 8 weeks of intrauterine life. That's the average time period of appearance of the primary ossification centers in the long bones. Except, of course, you know this the clavicle is the first bone to start ossifying. And it has like two primary centers of ossification, and it appears around the third, fourth week of intrauterine life. Third to fourth week. So that's an exception. And normally the primary centers they appear before birth and around six to eight weeks. Now about the secondary ossification centers. Secondary ossification centers, you know, all of them, they appear after birth, except two major examples, remember, and that is the knee joint. So, lower end of femur, you have an epiphysis, the secondary ossification center for the lower end of femur, and the secondary ossification center for the upper end of tibia. These are the two secondary ossification centers that appear before birth. That's around the nine month of gestation or just before birth. The secondary ossification centers for the lower end of femur and upper end of tibia, they have already, you know, uh, they start ossifying. The rest of the secondary ossification centers, they appear after birth. Now we're talking is about the second ossification center, the growing end. That is, let's we presume this is one year of life. One year of life means after birth. Secondary ossification center, this will be the opposite end. Let's mention that this is the growing end, right? And this is the opposite end. So the secondary ossification center at the opposite end will be the next to appear, the last to appear. And this, let's say, is appearing in around three years of life. So it is the last to appear. This is first to appear. Now the growth starts happening after three years of life. Now the bone is growing in both the ends. But the growing end is leading growth because it has appeared before. Now it comes around the age of 16 to 18 years. That's the time of around skeletal maturity. That's the time of fusion of epiphysis with the metaphysis. So which epiphysis will fuse first? The growing end or the opposite? The law says that the growing end is last to fuse. Right? So this will fuse with the metaphysis first let's say now this end fuses at around uh, 18 years after 18 years you find there is no epiphysis remains here and this has all ossified and fusion is called synostosis right and by the way this joint here this joint actually, this is a joint which is not a permanent joint. It is only there until there is growth happening. So such a joint is called, what is this joint classified as? This is called as primary cartilaginous joint. So primary cartilaginous joints are a variety of, you know, it's primary cartilaginous joints. Uh, they are temporary joints. They do not persist throughout life. Until there is growth happening, 
they, they are there, but after the cessation of growth of a bone, these joints disappear. So the joint between the three pieces and the pieces is the number of primary cartilaginous joints. Now because growth is happening here, so let's say this undergoes synostosis at around 20 years. Synostosis, there's a fusion at this end because it's growing end, so this will fuse last, and it will fuse around 20 years of life. Now let's compare the two ends. Growing end and opposite end. Opposite end. So at the growing end, grow, the secondary ossification center it appeared at one year of life. And then the cans, the osseous tissue was being laid down since then. And it fused at around 20 years of life. Till 20 years of life, there was growth happening at the growing end. Now, at the opposite end, the secondary ossification center was appearing at around 30 years of life. And it was fusing at 80 years. So it got fused at 80 years. So what was the time period for the laying down of osseous tissue at the opposite end? It will be around, let's say, 15 years. So opposite end got a time span of around 15 years to lay down the osseous tissue. Got it? And at the growing end, the osseous tissue was being laid down since first year of life till 20 years, so he's getting like 20 years to ossify to lay down this bone. I hope you've understood now the reason of third point now. So, fourth point is an explanation for your third point. I hope you've understood. Now this why the growing ends are bulkier? They are getting more span of time to lay down the osseous tissue. So they become bulkier. Allah being an exception, I have already discussed that. Let's take an example of traction devices at the opposite end. So it is bulkier at the opposite. Otherwise, the law follows with all the laws. Fourth criteria also has an exception. Now this criteria has this exception here. There is a bone which does not follow this rule number four, and that is exception. Exception here is fibula. Fibula is an exception here. Why fibula is an exception? First of all, let me tell you that in case of fibula, <coughs> let's draw this. I am drawing a, let's say the anterior view of the right leg. So anterior view of the right leg will be like this.
secondary ossification center is first to appear at opposite end. This is another exception for fibula. Make sure you know these important points. Then why have it disobeyed the law of ossification? Reason again here is now the reason is that the lower end of fibula is a pressure at the crisis, right? It articulates with the talus and also with tibia. So it causes lower tibia fibular joint and the plane phenomenal joint with the talus later. And as the child grows, it starts walking after one year of the life, starts, you know, standing up and then with the help of, you know, then walking with the help and after one, 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 18 months, completely free walking. So that means the bone is growing and the child or the infant needs, infant or child needs to stabilize its ankle. So there is the need of bone growth at the lower end of fibula earlier than the upper end. So remember that's the reason that the secondary ossification center at the opposite to the fibula is more rapid and is first to appear and the reason here is of pressure epiphysis. Pressure epiphysis. Got it? Again another one. And then there will be the secondary ossification center at the growing end. Now this is the growing end, but it is second to appear. This is second to appear. First is the lower end. And that I told you. Now it's time for around 18 years. Now the time has come for synostos for the fusion for the two ends, which will fuse first. The law says that the growing end should fuse last. Now here fibula will obey this law. So that means fibula partly disobeys the law at the point of appearance of the ossific second ossification center, but at time of fusion it follows the law. So which end will fuse first? The lower end will fuse first. Why will it follow the law in this case? The reason is tibia and fibula need a symmetrical growth elongation. Tibia is still growing. When tibia is still growing, fibula also has to keep growing to keep, keep the pace with the growing upper end of tibia. So to make the pace of vertical growth with the tibia, fibula also keeps growing upwards. And that's why if you talk about fusion, this opposite end is first to fuse. This opposite end is first to fuse while the growing end is last to fuse. And the reason is to make up the pace of vertical elongation along with the tibia because tibia keeps growing. Got it now? So that was along for it things about the growing ends along those. I believe I have taught you all the really important points. Only the last you know small point that's left up. And that actually is about the um, blood supply of long bones. The blood supply of long bones. I think it is just some space here. So this actually the blood supply of long bones you have to learn this up for this particular video. I'm not going to explain the I mean make you learn the blood supply of the long bones. I'll just write it out so that you know actually. So the topic is blood supply of long bones. Blood supply. We have this nutritional artery, injury, and let me put that a long bone does not only get perfused only by this nutritional artery. 
There are also peripheral blood supply from the muscles, like muscular branches, periosteal branches. There is blood supply from the periphery also, like this, from all the sides. There are muscles attached, so the muscular branches, the periosteal branches, they all supply the blood from the periphery. But what enters into the nutritional foramen is called the nutritional artery, and that's what we call as the blood supply to the long bone. So in this case, let me ask you, what will be the blood supply of clavicle? <coughs> First of all, what will be the direction of nutritional artery in a clavicle, medial or later? Simple, growing end of the year, right? You know the growing end, that is towards the head, so medial end is the growing end. So the nutritional artery will be directed towards the later end of the clavicle. And what artery supplies blood here is, remember, it is suprascapular artery. Suprascapular artery supplies blood. Although you have a branch from the thoracoacromial trunk also. Okay. But they are providing the peripheral supply. Suprascapular artery provides a nutrition artery to the clavicle, which is directed laterally. Now, although not a long bone, I have mentioned scapula here so that you remember that blood supply to scapula is also from the same artery. Easy. The suprascapular artery provides nutrition to both the clavicle and scapula. Then, humerus. Humerus, the nutritional artery will be directed upwards or downwards, think about the growing end, so the nutritional artery will be directed downwards. And this is a branch of brachial artery. Nutritional artery to humerus is a direct branch from brachial artery. Then radius. Blood supply to radius will be from which artery? Anterior interosseous artery. Anterior interosseous artery that runs over the interosseous membrane in the front of the forearm. It's a branch of the common interosseous artery, and common interosseous is the branch of ulnar artery. And ulnar, <coughs> ulnar, ulnar artery, soon after crossing the skeletal fossa, it gets a branch. It's the largest branch here in the forearm. Then common interosseous artery gives anterior and posterior interosseous artery. Anterior interosseous artery is the main continuation, is the main continuation of this common interosseous while the posterior interosseous artery is a miniature branch which goes into the back of forearm and it supplies the only in the upper two thirds of the forearm, back of forearm. While this anterior interosseous artery, because you know more of bulk of tissue is here on the flexor side, less of tissue is here. So there is a dominant artery, anterior interosseous artery, which supplies blood. And it perforates the interosseous membrane and reaches into the back of forearm and reinforces the posterior interosseous artery. And this anterior interosseous artery is the artery which passes below the extensor retinaculum in the fourth compartment below the extensor retinaculum. So don't confuse, it's not the posterior interosseous artery, it's the anterior interosseous artery which passes below the extensor retinaculum at the wrist. Got it now? So, Blood supply varies by anterior interosseous arteries and ulna. What will be the blood supply of simple air? Same artery, anterior, anterior interosseous arteries being the major continuation of our common interosseous artery, supplies blood to both the bones of the forearm, radius, and ulna. Now, femur. Femur, what will be the blood supply of femur? If you compare to homology, it will be easy. Here it's brachial artery, the axial bone of the arm, by brachial artery, and that's the axial bone of the thigh. So what will be the blood supply to femur? Ideally, it should be like one humoral artery, because here it's brachial artery. But the tissue, you know, if you take a brand, transverse section to the thigh, comparing to the arm, there's a lot of tissue surrounding the central bone. So that's why humoral artery needs a branch which should go deep inside to supply the femur. And that's why the nutrition branch of the femur, by the way, what will be the direction of the nutrition artery in the femur? Upwards and upwards? Upwards. Growing end is the lower end. 
So now that will be the by profunda. Profunda femoral arch. So femoral artery gives its deep branch, that's called profunda femoral artery, which goes deep inside to supply blood to the femur. Now to be more precise, and this question becomes more precise, you know that profunda femoral artery gives out four perforators into the back of thigh. Now these perforators obviously divide medially, then they pierce all those you know muscles that are in the linea aspera and all of them ultimately perfuse laterally into the back and that is vastus lateralis. So here you have one, two, three and four perforators of profunda femoral artery. Which perforator, it's an MCQ in itself, one, two, three, four. Which perforator of profunda femoral artery will provide nutrition to femur. Remember, it is this second perforator. This provides nutrition to femur. Second perforator of profunda femoral artery provides nutritional branch to femur. An important point about the first one, this first one, remember, it actually essays and it participates in a cruciate anastomosis at the back of thigh. So, important point about this first perforator of the profunda femoral artery is that it participates in the cruciate anastomosis at the back of thigh. And what of those particles participating in this cruciate anastomosis from above downwards? Above downwards, this is inferior gluteal artery, a descending branch. Transverse branch from the lateral circumflex femoral artery and a transverse branch from medial circumflex femoral artery and from below what is it is the first perforator first perforator from profunda femoral artery so two important points with these perforators cruciate and nutritional foramen okay this is cruciate now blood supply to tibia. What will be the blood supply of tibia? Compare the homology with the upper lips. Here it was anterior interosseous artery providing blood to both radius and ulna. So what will be the blood supply here in for tibia? Now in the leg, this popliteal artery above to this interosseous membrane at the upper rim of the upper margin it divides into anterior tibial and posterior tibial arteries which will be the main continuation of the popliteal artery anterior tibial or posterior tibial just like posterior tibial bulk of the tissue of the back of the leg is much more right and that's a flexor side so posterior tibial artery is a continuation of popliteal artery anterior tibial artery is a miniature branch okay now so that posterior tibial artery will provide nutrition to tibia so it is posterior tibial artery that gives a nutritional branch to tibia. Why then? What will be the direction of the nutritional foramen in tibia? Upwards or downwards? Downwards. Upwards only going in is upwards and nutritional artery will be directed downwards. Lastly, fibula. Fibula. First of all, growing end of fibula is upwards or downwards. It's clear now. The growing end. You know what has been mentioned in four criteria always and always you always go with this criteria for determining the growing end of the long bone. There are no discrepancies in this. Correct? So the upper end of fibula will be the growing end. So the direction of nutrition from an end the fibula will be downwards. Next thing, what will be the blood supply to fibula? Homology. Comparing the alma. So if alana, the blood supply is by anterior interosseous artery, what will be the blood supply to fibula? You would say that it is posterior tibial artery if you compare the homology. But again, it's uh, you are correct, but not completely correct. The funda is correct, but the answer is not correct. The reason is uh, the bulk of tissue in the back of the leg is much more compared to the bulk of tissues here in the forearm anteriorly 
So this posterior artery posteriorly in the leg is not sufficient enough to supply blood to all the tissues in the back of the leg. So what happens is this posterior artery it gives its lateral branch and that is the largest and the longest branch of posterior artery and that's called peroneal artery or fibular artery. So that peroneal artery and fibular artery or fibular artery will supply peroneal, peroneal artery. This peroneal artery will provide a nutritional branch to fibula. Got it? Your funda is collected. Blood is going via this posterior artery, but not directly cut through the posterior peroneal artery. Now, if you compare the homology, anterior tibia was actually perforating this interosseous membrane and reaching into the back of forearm. I told you because the posterior tibial artery, uh, posterior interosseous artery is a miniature branch here. Similarly, anterior tibial artery is a miniature branch of popliteal artery. So, what happens is here, so compared to homology, the interosseous membrane is again going to be pierced in the leg. And now it's not the posterior tibial artery, it will but Peroneal artery. So the peroneal artery will perforate the interosseous membrane in the leg from posterior compartment and will enter into the anterior compartment to reinforce blood supply in the lower one part of the leg. Got it? So though so much important point is this lecture is actually full of important points for your MCQs. I think I have taught you enough for this uh, lecture video. Uh, please uh, watch it carefully and if you're not getting it, you can uh, give me your comments and I'll be happy to answer them. Okay, thank you.